more about that. Jacob. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, David, for having me. So the talk today is called Rabbis, Merchants, and Consuls, the Marachi family of Morocco. And I will go ahead and start. So here's a possible meaning of the, of the name Marache. In old uh, documents, Spanish documents, uh, the city of Marrakesh is sometimes called Marosh, and the country of Morocco is sometimes called Marrakesh. So it's, there's kind of a confusion between those two names. And uh, in Mallorca, in Spain, the, let me just jump, there's a city called Marachi, M-A-R-R-A-X-T-I. And it's a thought that uh, this city got its name from the uh, Amoravid Berbers who conquered it in, in the 11th century. So they might have named it after Morocco or after Marrakesh. So it's possible that the Marachi family either came from here at some point or you took the name. So let's just go back. Um, this theory comes from um, Avrami Tzak Laredo, who has a book called Le, Les Noms de Juifs de Maroc. And he chronicles all the various last names from Morocco and he gives plausible um, possible information where the, the name comes from. Another option for the name, which I'm not a big fan of, but is that uh, in Arabic, the word Maraji, which is uh, another pronunciation of the name, um, is a profession, somebody who fishes in the swamps. I prefer the, the other <laughs> option. And if it is from the, the word Marrakesh, so there's different um, possibilities of what that actually means. It's possible that it's uh, two words in Amazir, which is Amur and Akush, which means land of God. Um, there's another explanation to it from an 11th century document, uh, which was found in the Library of Fez, which uh, says that Marrakesh means the uh, country of the sons of Kush. Here is a, a screenshot from uh, the book of uh, Avram Laredo, where after he gives an explanation for the name, he lists various uh, members of the family. The first one he lists is Rabbi Samuel Marash, who was a rabbi in Fuentes. And um, so he was a rabbi from Fuentes in Spain, and he was an official in the synagogue of Huesca. And he, sorry, and um, he finds him referenced in an inquisition document from 1489, where there were a number of Jews in Huesca who earlier had become Christian, but I suppose weren't really following the rules. They were still you know, going to synagogue and doing whatever they liked. So by 1490, when the trial came up, it said in the documents that Rabbi Samuel Marash had already left Huesca. They say that he might have either gone, gone to Zamora or to, or to Portugal. But the other Jews who were in Huesca at the time were actually burnt at this trial. And I believe one of them was uh, Abraham al Muslima. Other Marachis that we find in, in Spain at the same time, here is with the actual current spelling, is two brothers, Alonso Garcia Marache and Fernando Garcia Marache in Jerez and in Sevilla. So they also likely converted quite early before the expulsion in the 1480s. Um, and they're recorded in a, in a book by Juan Gil called uh, Los Conversos y la Inquisición Sevillana. So Rabbi, here is uh, the reference to Rabbi Samuel Marat, which comes from the, the book by uh, Fritz Berre, where he looked at the original Inquisition Proceso, which uh, is meant to be in the archives of Saragossa. I've contacted them, but uh, at the moment they still can't find it. But it, it gives us a little bit of information about him. Interestingly, I found another reference to him um, in a book which uh, goes through the um, notorial archives of Saragossa. And here it speaks about his widow. So now we know who his wife was. And it says that his widow was called Mira and her brother was a shoemaker, Garcia de Alcala. And um, it speaks about an agreement between him and another man who are going to teach their son, Sentosino, um, shoemaking. So the name Sentosino obviously is not a Jewish name, so I assume that by this point, his uh, widow and his son as well must have uh, converted to Catholicism. And this, I don't know the exact year for it, but it should be in the 1490s. 
So the next reference we have to the family is not in Spain, it's in Portugal in uh, 1495 and 1496. There was a Rabbi Yaakov Marache in Santarem. And um, I found this reference in the book uh, of Judeos in Portugal. And it references a document um, in the archive of the Torre de Tombo. And this is the original document, which uh, <laughs> is extremely hard to read. And this is a little snippet of uh, what it says there in Portuguese. And I have a translation here. And apparently it seems that there was a, a couple, a man and a woman, um, the husband was called Joao de Sequeira and his wife was Eria Gonçalves. And they claimed that uh, Rabbi Yaakov tried to force himself on, on this woman. And apparently he was, uh, the rabbi was arrested and, and jailed. And later on, it was found out that this wasn't true. And um, so the rabbi was released and uh, apparently this couple were exiled from Santarem for a period of two years. So after 1492 in Spain and then 1496, 97 in Portugal, we don't find the family uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula anymore. And the first mention we have of them in Morocco is in Tetuan um, on a document from the 17th century where it speaks about various uh, Jewish merchants and businessmen. And um, some of them actually were dealing uh, in slaves, uh, probably Christian slaves at the time. And um, so I don't have the exact year again for this, but it seems to be mid to late uh, 17th century. And we have uh, a reference to Samuel Marache. Now I'm going to jump quickly to Amsterdam and then back, back to Morocco. So in the same uh, time or a bit later, we have uh, a ketuba in Amsterdam from 1713 of a man called Solomon ben Benjamin Marache, who was uh, probably born around 1686 in Tetuan. From the Ketuba, we know that his father is Benjamin and is still alive at the time. And he was marrying Rachel, the daughter of Yosef Hazan and uh, Luna Machuro de Leon. Uh, the, this family, Yosef Hazan and Luna Machuro, I believe were from the Ottoman Empire. Um, Ton Tilen found this, this uh, reference to Solomon Marache in the archives of the city of Amsterdam. And in 1717, uh, Solomon Marache sold 38 pairs of tefillin to Etzheim. It's not clear if he wrote them or if he had possibly purchased them somewhere else and brought them over. Um, we know that Solomon and his wife, Rachel, had uh, a number of children who died young in Amsterdam. And they had a son called Benjamin, who married a woman called Esther, but it wasn't in Amsterdam. We know of this because Esther returns to Amsterdam in the 1740s or 50s uh, as a widow and she gets sent as a dispatcher, um, I believe to Curaçao. Now in Jamaica, we have a reference to a burial of a rabbi, Rabbi Solomon Marachi. And the, he, in 70, he died in 1735 and he was about 54 years old. It's possible that this is the same Solomon Marachi that we, that we see in Amsterdam. So back to Tetuan. So the most well-known, I suppose, uh, member of the Marachi family of Morocco, or most, most important is a rabbi called Rabbi Yaakov, son of Solomon, uh, sorry, son of uh, Samuel Marache, who was a, a Kabbalist in Tetuan in the, in the 17th and, and 18th century. We, we don't know when he was born or when he died, but, um, he had a group of Kabbalists which he used to study with, and the youngest one in, in the group, which we know this from different writings, was called uh, Rabbi Abraham ben Musa. And Abraham ben Musa was born in 1650. So, and in the writings, Abraham ben Musa speaks of uh, Rabbi Yaakov Marchi very highly as, as his teacher. So I'd assume that he would, Rabbi Yaakov was probably at least 10 years older than him. So I give him an estimated birth year of about 1640. And we know that by 17, I believe 1730, he's referred to as deceased on various documents. But in uh, 1722, we know he's still alive because there's, a, there's an account of him being uh, written by rabbis in Morocco that Rabbi Yaakov was at home in Tetuan. And uh, he had some type of uh, kind of vision where he saw that a friend of his had died in first. And he told his wife, sorry, I need to, I need to leave and uh, go attend to my friend. But apparently he didn't 
leave physically, just spiritually, because you know, being a Kabbalist, he could supposedly do these things. There's a few other stories about him. Um, another one is that at another time there was a dispute in the Bet Din of Fez. And again, he knew about this just because of his uh, you know, Kabbalistic powers. And he transported himself spiritually to the Bet Din to resolve the matter and came back. It's also said about him that uh, when he died in, in Tetuan, that whilst his funeral was going on in the, in the Cemetery de los uh, Castillos, there was another funeral held for him in uh, the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. These stories about him I heard from uh, one of his descendants, Andrew Strum, who lives in Australia and who's helped me a lot with the, the family. He built the main branch of the Tetuan family. So here, just to put things in, in uh, perspective is a little family tree. So at the top, we've got uh, Samuel Marache, the father of this uh, Rab Rabbi Yaakov. Then we have Rabbi Yaakov and his son Samuel. And on the, on the left side, we've got one of the lines from Tetuan, which is completely recorded um, from a uh, ketubah that they have. And their ketubah takes them all the way back to Rabbi Yaakov. Now, uh, in the middle is the Maracha branch of uh, Mogador and Agadir. And as you can see, there's a few generations missing. And on the right side uh, is my branch from Gibraltar. So my Marachis arrived in Gibraltar, I believe, in 1758. The first one there was Avram Marache. He came as, at the age of 15. And uh, we know he, he was born in, in Tetuan. Now, we don't know who his father is but his, his eldest son was called Samuel, so we hypothesize that his father was Samuel. Now, what we don't know is whether his father Samuel is the same as this Samuel, the son of uh, Rabbi Yaakov. But uh, I actually got a DNA test, a Y DNA test, as well as a member of the Marachi family of Mogador, as, and a direct descendant of Rabbi Yaakov who lives in New York. And we all match exactly the same, with a 97% probability of sharing a common ancestor within the part, last eight generations. Uh, so it sort of, sort of fits. We still need to uh, fill in the, the missing generations for the branch of Mogador, but on a ketubah that they have, which they list back to Avraham Maracha here, um, he is referred to as a descendant of Rabbi Yaakov. So it's, it's fairly plausible. And uh, here is uh, a ketubah that was sent to me by uh, Andrew Strum in Australia, and this is one of the branches of, of Tetuan. So this is a marriage in 1943 between uh, Solomon Marache and uh, Alegria Naon, and you can see that it uh, records all these generations: Solomon, Ben Yaakov, Ben Solomon, son of Jacob, son of Abraham, son of Jacob, son of Samuel, son of Jacob Maracha, the catalyst. Um, in Morocco, usually Ketubot will have the bride, the groom, the father, and the grandfather. When it has more than those three generations, it's usually rabbinical families, um, or more often families from the north, from you know, central or south, southern Morocco, this is not so much the case. Here's another Ketubah from the same family, from Tangiers from 1950s, and it's between Clara Marache and uh, Jacob Lasry. And again, it lists all these generations back to the, to the 17th century, to Rabbi Yaakov Marache. So here's a, a letter written in uh, Hebrew script in Soletreo, but the language is Judeo-Spanish and it even has a bit of kind of Portuguese uh, hints in it. And uh, we don't have a date for it, but we believe it's probably early, early 18th century. And it's Rabbi Yaakov writing to Mimona Bekasis, who seems to be in Algeria. And he's telling him that he's uh, sending him another, a number of manuscripts. And these are probably the manuscripts that Rabbi Yaakov wrote because he wrote a commentary on the, the Tsar. So he's saying that he's sending them to him and he's asking for payment. He also tells him that uh, he, Pesach is coming soon and he doesn't have any money to, to make the holiday of Pesach. So he asks him for you know, a donation as well. And he tells him of his desire to travel to Algeria to meet him and also to be able to, from Algeria, to travel to, to Israel. But uh, he, he never did get it, make it to Israel because we know he, he died in Tetuan. There's uh, actually another story about him that uh, one year in Pesach, on the eve of Pesach, a number of his children's or sons either died or were very ill. Um, and in order to, to stop this, he decided to 
slaughter a number of chickens as a kapara, as an atonement to ask God to please have mercy. So we don't know if his children did die or not, but ever since then, the Maracha branch that stayed in Tetuan were known as Los Maraches del Gallo, the Marachis of the chicken, because of this tradition that they keep on uh, doing till today. And again, I had this story from Andrew Strum. Here's a transcription of the, of the text, which was uh, done by Rabbi Dova Cohen. And it uh, basically says what I, what I just summarized. So here we have from a book called Tachkanot Chachmei Fez, we have a signature of Rabbi Samuel Marachi. It's from either 1739 or 1740. This is presumed to be the son of Rabbi Yaakov, who we're just speaking about, and possibly the, the father of my first ancestor who came to Gibraltar. Now, this is something that uh, Ton found in the, in the Amsterdam archives. So in 1743, payments from the Portuguese uh, Jewish community of Amsterdam um, commence again to Tiberias as they had stopped for, for a while. And in it, there's a note, para Rabbi Samuel, por Itzhak David. So Ton interprets, interprets this as for uh, Rabbi Samuel Marache by Itzhak Davega. So presumably Itzhak Davega, who uh, was a Parnas in Amsterdam, I suppose, was traveling to Tiberias and was going to take the donation from the community as well as something for Rabbi Samuel. We don't, at this time in the mid um, 18th century, we don't know of another Samuel Marache in Morocco. So again, it's plausible that this is the same Samuel. Now, this is one of the most uh, well-known members of the uh, Maracha family from the Tetuan branch. He moved to Tanta in Egypt in about 1871 uh, with his wife and children, and he was a very prosperous merchant. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Egyptian Cotton Exchange, um, and he de dealt in, in textiles. We know that he gave uh, dowries to girls from poor families. We also know that uh, a separate Torah um, still exist in uh, in Egypt, which he had uh, donated in the memory of his wife. Um, and for a while, he settled in in Manchester with a number of his sons, and later returned uh, to Egypt, where he died in 1923. So now we jump um, to the Holy Land. So in 1855, on the Montefiore census, we have somebody called Chacham Mordechai Marache. Um, he appears twice on the 1855 sentence, but, census, but I believe he's the same person. Once is 68 years old and once is 55 years old. It says he's from Rabat. Uh, he's married, but we don't have the name of his wife. And that he has a, a son named uh, Moshe, who I believe was um, about uh, 20, 20 years old at the time. We also find his tombstone on the Mount of Olives. I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, but we have the epitaph. So he's referred to as a complete sage who is oppressed in anguish, who deals with the needs of the public, the Honorable Rabbi Mordechai Marache, who died in 5639, so that was 1879. Now, the reference to who deals with the needs of the public is interesting because this tells us that he probably had some sort of um, role within the community, the Western Sephardic community of Jerusalem at the time, which leads us on to a ketubah from Rabbah. So I got this ketubah from a friend of mine, um, Albert Benatar, who's, who's uh, from Rabat and descended from uh, the Benatar Marachi families. And on this ketubah from 1866, the groom is Abraham ben Mordechai, Mordechai is still living at the time, uh, ben Yaakov ben Natan Marachi. So it lists a number of generations and the bride is Rachel bat Aaron ben Yaakov ben Chaim Benatar. So, I suspect that this Mordechai, who's the father of the groom in 1866 and still alive, is potentially the same Mordechai who we see in the Holy Land. And why do I think this is? Because on this ketubah, Mordechai is referred to as Gazbal in Hebrew, which uh, could mean uh, treasurer. Um, so I believe he might have been the treasurer of the community in, in Israel at the time. And we learn more about Mordechai and his other children. Uh, from a book called Shoshanim Le David by Rabbi David Sabach. So basically a lot of the places where I find uh, the information about the various Jews in Morocco is from books uh, of responses, or they're known as Shelot Vichuvot, questions and answers. And these essentially were 
books where various rabbis wrote, in a sense, the, the kind of PhD thesis, you know, of, uh, of what they had done in their lifetime or the different uh, rulings they had to make. So in this book by David Sabach, he writes about what to do with a property that's been part mo partly mortgaged and you want to unmortgage it, but it's between siblings. So basically there was no idea of uh, of uh, privacy <laughs> back back then. So he, you know, in this book, he speaks about the marriages, divorces, and he names the people straight up. So in, in this uh, snippet that I find, he speaks about uh, Rabbi Mordechai Marachi, who had passed away and he had mortgaged uh, his synagogue to his son, Chaim Natan Marachi, for 50 duros. But after the death of Rabbi Mordechai, and also actually the death of Rabbi Natan, um, Another of his sons, Abraham, wanted to redeem the property and make it available for the heirs uh, in Rabat and, and in Brazil. And this property actually um, is his synagogue, which uh, is known as the Benatar synagogue in, in Rabat. But because the, I suppose because the Marachis and the Benatars married each other so often in Rabat, one generation, this, this property was in the, the hands of the Marachis. Um, but in the end, uh, uh, Abraham, his son, does manage to redeem it. Um, so in the previous document, sorry, he had mentioned one of his sons as Chaim Natan Marache. And here on the right, we have the grave of Chaim Natan Marache, who we believe was born about 1835 and died in 1907 in Rabat. And to the left, we have the grave of one of his sons, Meir Marache, who died in 1946. They were both rabbis, and I found uh, these graves in Rabat. Uh, there's no index. All I was doing was uh, just uh, going grave by grave in the more older section. Um, and it was after two days of being there. And the end of the second day, I was quite despaired. And all of a sudden, I looked down and I, I saw one Marachi grave, another. And there, there was a whole area. So basically, they were burying them not according to year, but in family plots. Mm. Here is uh, another one of his grandsons from his son, Abraham, who was also a rabbi. Rabbi Aron Marache. This is his, his grave in Rabat. And he was also um, a, a rabbi in the same Benatar synagogue in the Melach of Rabat. And just to put things a bit into context, so here we have a, a small family tree of the Marachis of Rabat. Obviously, it's, it's way bigger, but I just wanted to put a few of the people that I just spoke about to make it clear. So when I started researching the Marachis of Rabat, it seemed like there were many branches and um, they didn't know how they connected to each other, but they assumed at some point they might have, must have been connected. But what I did was uh, ask various members of the Marachis of Rat Rabat, which I could uh, track, track down around the world, to send me the Ketubot if they had. And all the Ketubot listed back to Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Marache and Rabbi Natan Marache, who lived in the 18th century in, in Rabat. So I, I believe the first mention we have of uh, Marache and Rabat is around 1730, 1750. So we believe that the Marachis of, of Rabat got that from, from Tetuan. Here's another member of the uh, uh, Marache family from Rabat who is also well known, Rabbi Yitzhak Marache. We believe he was born around 1830 and he died in 1912 in Casablanca. He's buried in the old cemetery in, in Casablanca, but I haven't been able to find his grave yet. So we know that he studied in the yeshiva or, of Rabat alongside the rabbis such as Yekutiel Berdugo. And we know that he had his own synagogue in, in Casablanca. And before Casablanca organized themselves as an official community, which happened under the French protectorate, the different rabbis from different communities acted as their judges for their own communities. So we know that he was the Dayan for the Rabatis in, in Casablanca. Um, he married a woman called Esther. We don't know her surname. And they had at least six children, Moshe, Leticia, Ra Rachel, Samuel, Sultana, and Jacob. Um, it's believed that he was the son of Moses Marachi. And actually this branch of the Marachi family from Rabat have a tradition that this man's mother was a Rachel Marachi from Gibraltar who must have been born around 1800. Um, obviously, I've, I've never found this, this woman in the Gibraltar records, and we don't know of any connection between these two branches uh, in this time, but it's very interesting that they have that, that uh, memory. 
here um, in, in a book uh, for the encyclopedia of the Geonimo Sepharad, we have a mention to uh, Rabbi Natan Marache. And uh, here it says that he was born in Meknes, but actually I believe he was born in Rabat. And uh, he settled in the land of Israel in about uh, 1820. And he left um, as a shaliach for the community of Tiberia in about 1825 to Italy. And he went uh, across a few communities co collecting money. Here's uh, the epitaph from his burial. And again, he's called a complete rabbi, a wise and respected teacher, Natan Maraci, who died in 1838. And from another book uh, called Takanot Chachmi Meknes, we read about his first wife. And her name is Reina, a daughter of Chaim, son of Baruch. It doesn't give her surname, but uh, one of the biggest families in Meknes, and most important, was the Toledano family. And there was a Chaim ben Baruch Toledano at the time uh, in Meknes. So I, and we know that the Marachi family and the Toledano family married each other um, numerous times, both in Gibraltar and Meknes. So I believe that would be her maiden name. And here it speaks about in 1819, when uh, Rabbi Natan Marachi was making his way to the land of Israel from Meknes with his wife, Reina, that on the way they were in Oran in Algeria and she, she died and she's buried there and he continued on, on to Israel. So first of all, it's amazing that these records even survived, but obviously somebody in Oran wrote back to the local community in Meknes for the rabbis to record this in their, in their ledgers. Here is a transcribed a letter that was sent from the rabbis of Tveria to the rabbis of Meknes after the death of Rabbi Natan Marache. And in it, it speaks about um, his, his, widow, his widow. So we know from this, we know that he remarried in Israel. And uh, it speaks about his uh, orphan daughters. Um, and it, it speaks about uh, his son-in-law as well. So we kind of we were able to, to paint a picture of the family tree. And what it says, basically, this is only part of it, but the continuation speaks about the fact that the, the rabbis of Tver know that uh, the, the family of Natan Marache had money left in Meknes, that his father was called Senor uh, Yosef Marache, and his uncles, I believe, were Samuel and Yuda. And they're writing to the community of Meknes to please look for the property and the assets of this family so they can take care of the widow and the, the daughters of, of Rabbi Natan. So here's a little family tree that we can put together from these various records. So we have uh, Rabbi Natan in the middle, his first wife, Reina, who was possibly a Toledano. We know the name of his second wife was Simcha from uh, the Montefiore census of the Holy Land. We know his father was Yosef, his uncle, Sudan Samuel. And we know that one of his daughters married Yitzhak Cohen Scali, who was a Chacham from Tveria. And another daughter, Reina Marachi, married Chacham Yaakov Abulafia. From, uh, from Tver. So here in 1855 on the Montefiore census, we find uh, his wife as a widow, Senora Simcha, widow of Rabbi Natan Marache. She is 56 years old and from Rabat, uh, living with her son in law, Rabbi Yaakov uh, Abulafia. So even though in other sources it refers to Rabbi Natan being from Meknes, I believe that he was likely from the Rabat branch and his father and uncles were doing business in Meknes. They, they're known to have been uh, some of the richest merchants in Meknes at the time. Now, this is a story which I heard from a descendant of Rabbi, Rabbi David Busidan. David Busidan uh, was a rabbi of a community south of Marrakesh, um, a community of about 150 people who were taken uh, captive as prisoners by uh, a Berber tribe in a, about 1780 and they were brought to Meknes as prisoners and eventually redeemed. Um, and at the time, this Rabbi David Busidan wanted to reestablish his community, but of course he didn't have any means. So the story in the Busidan family is that he went to Tangiers to speak to the Marachi branch in Tangiers, because uh, apparently they were very wealthy in order for them to sponsor him. And they agreed to sponsor him and his new community, but that their wish was to be buried around him. So when people would come for his hilula, to pray at his grave, you know, they would also get the blessings. My theory is that probably it wasn't the Tangier branch, and uh, maybe that came into the story at some point, but it was probably the family of Natan Marache 
who we, I just spoke about as they were known as rich merchants and they were in Meknes at the time. So in Meknes, um, as you see, there's no names on the graves. We know the grave in the middle is uh, Rabbi, Rabbi David the Sudan and likely about seven or so of the graves around him belong to the Marachi family. So jumping to another branch. Here we have a Ketubah, um, can't remember the year now, but I believe it's um, about 1900 from, from Casablanca for Moshe ben Yosef ben Moshe ben Machluf Marache. So that gives us four generations and he's marrying a woman called uh, Leticia Matatia. And on the left, we have a document that Ton recently found um, in the uh, Dutch National Archives, I believe, for the Dutch consul in Morocco. So this letter is written in Hebrew letters in the Solestreo script, but the actual language is Arabic. Um, and it basically discusses payments of rents from the Dutch consul to Muslim uh, Moroccan landlords. And it's signed by Makhlouf Marache and uh, Moshe Aflalo in 1791 in Mazagan. Mazagan nowadays is El Jadida. So, we don't know for certain, but I suppose it, it's possible that this Makhlouf Marache mentioned on this Ketubah from uh, 1890 something or 1900 could be the Makhlouf Marache mentioned in 1791 in, in Mazagan. Now, there was another branch of, of, the, of the family in Mazagan and that area of Azemur, which was uh, Rabbi Solomon Marache. So, I found his Ketubah from 1910 on the National Library of Israel. And this is actually his, his first marriage to a woman called Solika Buena Niel. And on his Ketubah, it records him as Solomon ben Saadia ben Musa. Uh, Musa being Moses, but interestingly, they, they recorded him in, with the, his, his Arabic name. So uh, after finding this Ketubah, um, first of all, I was quite surprised to find a Marachi family on that side of Morocco, you know, on the Western coast, where usually they're in Tetuan or Tangiers or Rabat. Um, but I believe they might connect to the previous, the previous branch, uh, with, uh, which I showed up with Makhlouf being at the head, as we know that he was in Mazagan in the 1790s doing, doing business there. So here we have a picture of uh, Rabbi Solomon in his synagogue, in, in Mazagan, it was actually the synagogue of the Cohen family. And he died, I believe in about 1959. And his second wife, because uh, his first wife, he had one daughter with her and she died. And his second wife uh, moved to Israel with, with his young children. And when they moved to Israel, like happened uh, to many uh, Moroccan families, um, the, their surname was changed at some point, either made more Israeli or you know, misinterpreted. So they became the Madusha family. And this is why for a very, very long time, I couldn't find anybody from this branch um, till eventually one of the family kept on um, registering themselves with the original last name, even though it's not what they have on their, on their documents. And I was able to connect with them and get the photo of this rabbi. So here, moving on to the Tangier branch, we have, um, a consul. So we've got uh, Avraham ben Mimon Marache, who was born in 1863 in Tangiers and died in 1934 in Tangiers. Um, he actually travels to the United States in 1886 with another Jew from Tangiers called Judah Ruach. And within a number of months, he's naturalized and receives his passport. And then he's on his way back to Tangiers. And that was obviously planned because he became the, the consul in Tangiers for the United States. Here is his Ketubah, which I found on the National Library of Israel, which records a number of generations back. So we have Avraham, son of uh, Mimon, son of Moshe, son of Solomon Marache. So we know that his, his uh, grandfather Moshe was a rabbi, was a rabbi in Tetuan. And here is, is this grave from uh, 1934, which uh, I found in the old cemetery in Tangiers. And here's just a little part of the tree of the, of the Tangier branch. And um, here at the bottom left, you can see Avraham Marache, who married Simia Zankot from the Ketubah that I just showed. And his parents are Mimon and Rika, and his grandparents are Rabbi Moshe Marache and Dona Atias. And this Rabbi Moshe Marache for a while in the 1830s was actually a teacher in Gibraltar. And 
his furthest ancestor that we know is Solomon Maracha, born around 1865. Um, and he is the ancestor of the, all the Maracha branch of Tangiers. Usually with these Ketubot, which list more than three generations because of these rabbinical families where they remember, usually it's what I've seen is that it ends with the first person to arrive in a new place where they're living. So we believe that the Tangier branch came from Tetuan, but I believe that Solomon was probably the first one to come over in the mid 18th century. Here we have a brother of Abraham, Solo Solomon Marache, who became the consul for Portugal in, in Tangiers, and he lived between 1888 to 1961. Here we have a member of the Marache family from Gibraltar, also from my branch, but just a little further away. Uh, his name was Solomon Marache, and for a time he was the Spanish consul in Manaus, Brazil. And I also heard that later in life he was possibly the consul for Brazil in Gibraltar. So here's a photo of him, and here's his grave in the new cemetery in Gibraltar. Here's a picture of uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Avraham Marache, who was uh, consul of Venezuela in Gibraltar. I believe he became consul in the, in the 1930s. And um, he helped uh, some of the Jews of Tetuan get out and move to Venezuela in, in the 40s and 50s, I believe. And here's quite a, a funny picture right in the middle. I think it was in 1968, just before he died, when uh, I, I believe it was that Spain and Venezuela had voted against the UK at the United Nations over, over Gibraltar. Um, and here you see people um, coming to his house and trying to rip down the, the emblem of, of the Venezuelan consulate. Uh, here's a picture of uh, my grandfather, Samuel Marache, on his honeymoon with, his, with my grandmother, Reina Macias. And he became the consul of Ecuador, I believe, in, in the 1940s. And he also helped Moroccan Jews leave Morocco and, and move to Israel. Here we have another member of the Marachi family of Gibraltar, but not from my branch. It's, it's another branch. And uh, Moses Marachi, he was born in Gibraltar in 1838, son of uh, Shemtov of Marachi and Rachel Naon. And for a time, he lived in Beirut. Uh, in Lebanon, where a few of his children were born, later in Alexandria and Egypt, and finally he settled in Manchester where he died. So we know that he was a, a customs official and uh, he received uh, honors, I believe, he, I believe from, the, from the British military. Um, so back to the Marachis of Rabat. Um, here are two graves of, of two brothers, uh, which I found in Rabat, Samuel Marache and Yudah Marache. Uh, both the son of Moshe, sons of Moshe, and they were merchants um, of household linen and upholstery um, and fabric wholesales, wholesalers. So, sorry, I think I've gone a bit fast. Let me see where I am. The tree again. This I was only planning to speak about if, if I had time, but I see that I do. So, in Spain, pre-expulsion, pre you have the Marache family with various uh, spellings, and you also have the Amaraz, Amaras, Amaraic family. So this family, who you see here at the top, that listed in Segovia and Valencia, uh, this is appearances of the family still in Spain, pre-expulsion. And post-expulsion, there's an Amaragi family who appears in Turkey and later Salonika. And, um, Unfortunately, many members of this family died in the Holocaust, but um, there's still male descendants of this branch who I hope to be able to test, test them for the Y DNA one day to see if it is the, the same as the Marachi family. The reason I believe it's likely we're likely the same family is because the spelling in Hebrew of Amaragi and Marache is the same, just with an Aleph on the, on the beginning or without an Aleph. Um, Marachi is spelled with a gimel at the end, which has the sound of uh, G, but in uh, Judeo-Spanish it's actually pronounced as a chi or she, so that's where we get Marache from. But it's very plausible that when this family went to the Ottoman Empire, uh, that was not known, and that's how they became Amaragi, same as the Palache family in the Ottoman Empire became Pal Palaji, and the Farache family became Faraji. Um, there was also another 
There was also uh, another Maracha branch from, from Spain who appears post expulsion for the first time in Florence in uh, 1570. And we know that they made their way to Pisa and later settled in Livorno. And they can be traced all the way from 1570 up to 1900 uh, in Livorno. There were other branches which appear in Curacao, Suriname, Jamaica, St. Kitts. Um, but that branch, I'm not sure if they come from Morocco originally or if they, if they came from, from Livorno. I think that's the end of my presentation for the moment. I try to keep it short. Um, so if we have any questions. Uh, thank you. And, uh... Do you want to close the um, yes. the, uh, the PowerPoint? Um, first, uh, first, 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 first question of, of, of several, because I, th I think a lot of people think it's, it's almost impossible to, uh, to, to research Morocco. And actually, you've probably got it back further than most of the people studying the sort of uh, S&P who have all those documents in, in, in London and Amsterdam. You, you, you mentioned several times books of uh, responses which you've uh, used. Can you sort of tell us a bit more, for example, sort of where to find them? And also for people who, who don't speak Hebrew, is, is there any way of identifying which might be the relevant, uh, relevant books? So I would say, if, if you want to research your family in Morocco, um, find out obviously what city they lived in and then think of what era you want to search and then look for the rabbis who were active in that community at that time. See if they published any books. They're likely going to be in Hebrew. But as I said earlier, that for these rabbis who managed to have their books published either in their lifetime or later, it was a bit of their PhD thesis. And for the ones who were... Uh, on the Bet Din, then they saw multiple cases coming in front of them of property disputes. And as I said, there was no privacy, so they, they really list, you know, names and all the details. Um, so first of all, the best way to go about that, even if you don't speak or read Hebrew, is figure out how to write the name that you're searching for in Hebrew. Put it into Google, click Google Books, and you'll get a number of hits. Um, you probably won't be able to see the whole book uh, because they only scan part of it, but there's a website called Hebrew Books. And if you put the name of uh, these Hebrew books in, uh, they've got a lot, um, and as long as they're not modern ones, you should be able to download the whole book, do command search, put the surname in. You probably, you might not know what you're looking at, but at least that, that's a, a good start. Um, other places to find them, are uh, libraries which have manuscripts. So like the National Library of Israel, the British Library, Yale University, there's multiple. The problem with these manuscripts is obviously that it's either in Judeo-Spanish or Judeo-Arabic or Hebrew in script, which is very hard to read. But again, if you find the manuscript belonging to a rabbi from the community you're trying to research and the period you're trying to research, then get, a, uh, you know, get that manuscript, get pictures of it, and then try to find somebody who can decipher it for you because it's possible that there might be a mention of the family. Thank you. Um, I, th I think either you, you, you or my internet uh, had a bit of a, a moment then. Um, ne next question is on, on Ketubot because, um, you know, these Ketubot seem to be wonderful, at least on the, the, the mail line. Has anyone created a sort of meta index of, um, of, of where they all are? And there is... There was an index uh, created for Moroccan Ketubot, I believe, by Matil Tagger, and I think it's on um, Jeff Malka's website and also published in, in, a, in a book. I think IGRA, the Israel Genealogical Research Association, has that index as well. Yes. Um, but other, otherwise, I just basically search on any possible um, digital archive of library in the world with the word Ketuba and Morocco and try to see what comes up. Thank you. Um, Tom, do we have a question? I have a question about Ketubot as well. Uh, how trustworthy are these genealogies that you find in them? That's... Uh, uh, are you able to uh, confirm them from other sources? 
So yes, in, in this case, the ones that I've showed you, I have been able to confirm them through other sources like from graves or from these responses, which mentions who the father is. I mean, essentially it's a legal document and it's a religious legal document. So it's not just committing fraud. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it would be very bad religiously to be doing that. But I do know of, uh, of one case where, or maybe two cases where Ketubot were, I don't know if I would say forged, but um, details added to them with a, you know, potential fanciness of where the family might have come from. And actually in one of the Maracha branches that I was researching, I was expecting to find one name on the Ketubah and I found another name. And the name I was expecting to find at the top was Makhluf, but I found Moshe. Um, and the kind of explanation that I gave for this is that the ancestor was likely Makhluf, but we know that Makhluf died very young and his son was raised by his brother Moshe, who was a well-known rabbi. And it was his grandson getting married. So either he didn't know or something happened, but um, it's, it was still the same line. Um, but generally you can trust them. I mean, it's quite hard to find these long genealogies on them, but you can, you can trust it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a discussion going on in chat about the name Bakluf. Is the a surname, is it the given name? Uh, it's... It's in Morocco, it's a surname for Muslim families, not for Jewish families. Uh, there's a variant of it for Jewish families, which is uh, Khalfon or Khalfan. Makhluf means to change. Uh, so somebody who's a money changer is Khalfan Ksafim. But usually this name would have been given to, for example, in the Western Sephardic community, when somebody has a child, the child dies at a young age, and they have another child and they name him the same, but give him the extra name Chaim. In Moroccan communities, um, they would give the name Makhluf, meaning that he exchanged the one before. Sometimes it was a nickname or otherwise it became the, the given name. Thank you for that. Uh, I was wondering about that name because I've been studying the family de la Mar, and that's, that one starts in Amsterdam, but uh, Makhluf de la Mar, who is the head of the family, came from Morocco as well. Mm -hmm. And he might have been related to uh, to the Marches. I, yeah. I was wondering, uh, did, uh, can you prove connection between the family Marash in Livorno and in Morocco, or did I miss that in your talk? So what we've done so far is that I tested my Y DNA with Avotenu, and then I got a member of the Marachi family from Mogador to test, and a Marachi from New York who comes from Tetuan via, via Egypt. So we've all tested and we know that we connect and we share a common ancestor in the past uh, about eight generations ago. People who I haven't tested yet, which I hope to test, is the Amaragi family of Salonika. And there was also a Marash family in Salonika. Um, I know from Hebrew records that in Salonika, they spelled the name the same as us in Morocco and it was pronounced the same as well. It probably became Marash uh, once, you know, with the French influence. But I, I found an Amaragi, and I did find a Marash, but I haven't tested them yet from Salonika. But what I can't, can't find is a Marachi from Livorno. I mean, I'm very confident that it would be the same family. I'd love to find one. But basically, when the Marachis in Livorno stop appearing on, uh, in the community records, or in Livorno at all, in about 1900, there is a lot of Marachis appearing in New York as coming from Italy, but it's really not clear are these Catholic Italians because it was also a common name in Italy or are they from this community? If somebody can find one, <laughs> I'd love to test them. Yeah. Can you tell a bit more about the book by uh, Tavares? It sounds like an important book. Which one, sorry? Uh, the one by Maria Tavares is it, it's uh, called it, uh, that's either the portuguese one or the portuguese one the judeus in portugal yes also judeus in portugal yes so i don't have a copy of it i've only found that online but what i've understood is that basically the the book gives an index to various records in toro de tombo where jews are mentioned so it gives the location the year 
and it kind of can create uh, an index to where the Jews were in Portugal and at what time. Great. Going to look that up. Um, David, are there any questions on uh, Facebook? Uh, yes, we have one from JJ Marachi, who I'm assuming is Joshua. So, hi, hi, Joshua. Nice to see you. Um, who says, so what year did the first Marachi land in Gibraltar and also Khazakh Baruch? Um, in 1758, uh, Avraham Marachi, who was 15 years old, and he came from Tetuan. Um, and later he, he says, so Solomon Marachi moves from Tangier to Gibraltar mid 18th century, and all Marachis in Gibraltar descend from that Solomon. Is that correct? No. Okay. Um, no, I mean, I don't know if that's my uncle writing or my brother, but um, I, I think that's a confusion. <laughs> so, so, no. Okay, well, well, we'll leave that to uh, sort out privately. Um, and also from uh, F.Y. Sasso, um, how were you able to get that far back before the Spanish expulsion and to be able to find that amount of detail within your family? So first of all, even though I showed Marachis in Spain and Portugal, we, we don't know that it's yeah. ancestors or that it's a straight line, but it's nice to find references to the names. Um, basically, there's lots lots of books on, on Spain and Portugal to, to be looked at. But one to start with, if the family is from Morocco, is the Names of the Jews of Morocco by Abraham Laredo, and then the book uh, by Fritz Bayer about uh, the Jews in Spain and the Inquisition. I mean, it, it references so many Inquisition processors and family names. Okay. Um, Bada, do you have a question? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for a, a fascinating talk, and you've done a lot of work. I have to congratulate you on that. I've got some, I hope, simple questions. Can I start with Meknes and the graves? Um, you showed the pictures, and since my first brother-in-law's family came from Meknes, I'm particularly interested. There were no names on the graves. Is that normal, or is that because they were damaged? It looked as if they had been remade rather than being original. Um, so can you say something about that? The cemetery in McNess was recently renovated a little bit, so those old graves were painted white again, so they look, they look okay. fresh. But basically, as I understand it, the Sephardic tradition that was brought to Morocco from Spain was that we don't put names on, on our graves. And this was that only somebody without, off, without descendants, you'd put the name on so people would know who the grave is. Otherwise, it was up to the family to remember where the grave was and go and light candles and pray at the grave um, every, every, you know, every year on the date of the death. So obviously, the generation that left in the 1950s, if they go back to Morocco now, we can't find, find it. But we do know from the Marachi family of Tetuan that the generation that left in the 1950s still knew where the grave was, was of Rabbi Yaakov Marachi and used to go and light candles every year. So that was a tradition. In various communities in the north, names begin to appear probably in, in the 1850s, sometimes earlier. So yeah, it's a bit it's a bit difficult. In, it's a bit difficult to go back, but I do know that in Fez there's some very old ones with, with scripture. Because I was struck by the contrast with some of the incredibly um, full graves with complete family histories on them. And I thought it was a a real contrast. Um, another question, you um, showed um, Samuel Amaraic or Amaraiche or Amaraic um, and his bride, and it said 13th, 14th century, had the surname Nondedeo, which would be a Catalan surname, but a Catalan Christian surname. Um, and it's pre uh, the sort of mass conversions. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you can say something about the names and naming at that time. Well, I do know that there was already conversions um, in, in the area of Catalonia, I believe. And also, I can't remember now, there was an island, uh, one of the Spanish islands, which... Uh, Mallorca. Which, Mallorca? No, another one, but basically that there was early, early conversions, but again, the Jews were living a bit of a, a double life. They, they converted for convenience, I suppose, but kept 
their name, so did as they pleased. Okay, and two quick questions about um, Rabbi Jacob Ben Samuel. Um, you, I, I loved the story about his Kabbalistic ability to move to other places. And you talked about him um, rushing to Fez to resolve a problem with the Beth Din. Do we know whether that problem was solved? Uh, no, we don't know what, what uh, case that was about. I heard this from, from Andrew Strum. But yeah. the other story, another story where we know that he went to attend to uh, a friend's funeral, we know, I mean, the date, because we know which rabbi it was. Um, it was a Toledano. I can't remember now which one, but, but we know that. Okay, and my last question, and it, it also relates to him. You talk about him um, leading a, a group of Kabbalists and um, discussions, and it's around the time, I think, that um, Kabbalah was becoming part of Masonic mainstream in Spain. And I wondered if you know anything about the links between um, the Kabbalists and the, um, the Freemasons around that time and, and about the growing influences. I don't know about uh, any, any connection. I mean, I've heard about something like that, but I don't know about a connection between that. But on okay. Freemasons, uh, there were lots of Marathi Freemasons from, from Morocco as well, but I didn't put it into the, into the talk. But, uh, but that would be a useful link to know about. Thank you for that. That's really just a helpful thing that at some point I can pick up. So you've given me more than you thought you did. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Ellie, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. First of all, I just want to say what a fascinating talk. Um, you've done such a tremendous job. Now, I come from a family that is on both sides from Morocco. Goodbye on one side and, uh, and Leb, Aleb on the other. My, uh, I wanted to... Whether you saw, can you hear me? I don't know if no, you can still hear me. At the moment. What were you saying, sorry? If, if you saw that the King of Morocco should be mentioned here to, as he had he, he had put um, walls around most of the cemeteries. Yes, indeed. I mean, a lot of the cemeteries have been renovated in the past few years with their funds from, from the king. Um, and others are, are being renovated currently or will be renovated in the future. Um, because for a long while they had been left, you know, and they're very dilapidated. So that, that represents an ability to be able to go and research on that. I wanted to ask you specifically, when did you see that the country, modern country of Morocco, even under the French, I, I apologize, even earlier under the French or under the Spaniards, had records, birth records? Did they have, I know people were born at home, but at some point or another, did they begin to have records? For instance, my father was born in 1937. And my great grandfather was born in whatever was 1890 or so. Is there are there records? So yes, the the official birth uh, and death records of Morocco are from 1956 when they became independent. But obviously, already in 1912, when the French arrived, they started recording birth and death in you know more uh, low, kind of bigger cities. Um, and the people mentioned in those records, if they were French, those records are back in France um, in, I think, the archive in Nantes. And if they were Moroccan, the records might survive in the same office where you'd find the, the normal Moroccan records. But it's, it's a bit of a mess. Basically, you have to go there, schmooze a bit, um, give somebody some money, and hopefully they can, they can try to search for it. Other times, um, Jews would register their birth with the Bet Din and, or uh, a few years later. Uh, so if somebody was born in 1890 and they show up in, in Casablanca in 1920, they would go to the Bet Din with uh, two witnesses who would say, I know this person is from this village. These are his parents. This is how old he is. They, the Bet Din would write that out in, in Hebrew. Then they would take it to a notary who would translate it and, and stamp it. Then they could take that to the, either the French civil registry or the Moroccan one and get a, a birth certificate. So it's possible to find your, your father's and grandfather's uh, records, definitely. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, what else? Pedro says, I consider this exponent of blessing the roots of my family are Moroccan, and with the approval of Hashem, I will be able to improve my knowledge. That's, yeah. Maybe we'll be lighting candles for you as well. Um, Ton, are there any more? Um, oh, um, I would like to thank Jacob for mentioning Amsterdam a few times. <laughs> and well, thank I you always, for the records. <laughs> I'll always stress that uh, for Morocco, there are not that many records available from the 17th and 18th century. So you must look for sources outside of Morocco. And one of them are the great Portuguese Jewish archives of Amsterdam. It's sprinkled throughout. It's not indexed. So you need to do a lot of reading in Portuguese. But chances are you will find at least tidbits about your family like Jacob found about his own family. So, Thank and, uh, you. And Ali Ergensoy has a question. Uh, maybe I, I can give that live. Um. Uh, hi, sorry, I, I, I just wrote it in the in the in the chat, but. <laughs> it's a personal question. I, I'm absolutely fascinated by your apparent command of so many different languages. <laughs> and I wanted to know what they were, you know, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, maybe uh, Hebrew. Um, English, English and Hebrew from, from home and a bit of Spanish from home as well. But yeah, Spanish I learned a bit better later on whilst I lived in Spain. Um, and a little bit of Arabic. I took, uh, I took it for a few years at university but that was modern Arabic. And now I'm trying to learn a bit of uh, Moroccan Arabic, which is very different. Uh, Spanish helps with the Portuguese as well and with French, which you need for, for Morocco, so. And, and French, presumably. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, shall we, how are we doing for time? Well, we've, we've gone over an hour. Yeah. Uh, shall, shall we, um, Wind up, Tone, or do we have any yes. more questions? Great. Um, Shall I do that? Please do. As always, we are thankful again to our patrons who make all of this possible. Without them, this would not be happening. Thank you to our viewers on YouTube. I hope you had a good time as well. And especially thanks to Jacob for giving this lively talk and uh, dispensing with his uh, knowledge, which will increase and increase over the coming years. So he is always uh, welcome to come back again to speak to us about Moroccan sources. Next week, we will have uh, Jonathan Schoss, and this talk will be called, will be named. A trip to Ponarum, which uh, involves a story about uh, an early colonial expedition from Holland to Ponarum uh, uh, on the coast of northern, uh, south, uh, yeah, on the coast of uh, Latin America, above Brazil, uh, Suriname, Guyana, etc. It was a field experiment, but a very enlightening um, about Dutch colonial experiments and about uh, Jews going to uh, that side of Latin America as well. So we hope to see you all next week. And David. Great. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jacob. And um, good night.